right, it's 11.45. We're about to kick everything off. Um, it's a good attendance after what I saw yesterday, last night, so thank you for making it in the morning. Thank you for making it to the keynote. That is, that is awesome. Uh, today, we want to talk uh, a little bit about log management uh, and incident management. Uh, but I think what people want to see more of is how do you start to deal with your logs in a more reasonable manner, uh, how you manage to, 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 to distribute them to get a better visualization of what's going on. I think part of the hard part right now with logs is that people just see them as this stream of data. The one gentleman was telling me it's almost like a fire hose, and they can't distinguish what's an application problem, what's a server problem, and which server is having issues. So. For the purpose of this talk, uh, we're going to cover quite a few things. Uh, I think we had the vote for more practical, so we're going to try and look around some of these products. Uh, but first of all, are, is anyone using Logly, PagerDuty, or New Relic? Oh, wow. Everyone's using, wait, wait, let's, let's try that again. How many people are using Logly? How many people are using New Relic? Yes. Okay, cool. How many people are using PagerDuty? Very, very, very good. I did not expect that. And um, anyone using anything for public communications or internal communications like Slack, HipChat? And everyone's hands go up. Perfect. So what we want to talk about is what do you do when things hit the fan? In other words, how can you make your logs work for you when things aren't going well? Uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, we can all agree upon is that this is stressful. It's not easy and it's hard to deal with. So when we look at this problem, I think it's important to look at some of the other people who are out there. So Rackspace in 2014 did a study and that study was entitled, How Does uh, Downtime Impact Your Bottom Line? And so you people were given a set of criteria, uh, they are given a few questions. Uh, and we care particularly about two of those questions. The questions were multiple choice, and they were asked, firstly, what do you think are the greatest causes of downtime? 30% said weather environment related. I think Amazon went out in New York when they had the blizzard, so that seems fair. 33% is IT or equipment, so server failures. Uh, that seems fair. 34%, which is an increase, is cyber attacks. Uh, so if, if I think people need to be more conscious of this going forward. Uh, the internet is a scary place, and there are scary things happening there. And if everyone remembers Drupal Geddon, I think it is an ominous sign of the things that are out there, so we need to be prepared. However, I think the thing that surprised me the most was the fact that 48% was a result of human error. Mistakes that me as a developer, you as developers, engineers, project managers, we're all contributing to that 48%. It was the most selected thing for things that bring people down, and it's human error. So how do you account for this? The interesting part was 52% of them said that most, if not all, the downtime that they experienced from unplanned, unplanned outages could have been avoided. The question is, how can you avoid them? One of the things that I think we've found is that time is of the essence when you're responding. The longer you take to respond, the higher the cost you have to face as a business as a result of it. The other question that they asked people was, what does downtime cost you? So we're talking about the cost of tech support to get the system back and stable. Uh, the cost of going through risk, uh, more of a, a log analysis to do some uh, root cause uh, debugging to find out what the problem was, to see how much time did people lose getting, getting pulled off a project. If people have worked in support and maintenance, you kind of understand this, that while you're working on something, it's pretty easy to get pulled away by an emergency or a fire. But out of all of these things, I think there is one thing that is extremely important to highlight. The most the most terrible thing that could happen to you as a result of downtime that everyone could almost agree upon, well, 37%, which is pretty much everyone uh, who was there, was that the cost associated with your reputation and the damage to your brand is more important than the money that you'll lose. I think as service professionals and service providers, 
uh, it's important to understand that people have an expectation for us. Uh, and as a result, when things go wrong, they expect us to be there. You don't just build a site and it just doesn't go away. There are cyber attacks, there are DDoS attempts, and there are other injections that may occur. Which brings us to the next point. Who am I, and actually, why am I here? My name is Tamani Tundwani, and I'm a support manager at Pantheon. I've been there for about three and a half years. Uh, when I started, I was the first support engineer, and basically all we did was help people's sites get back online constantly. It was a ongoing and never-ending process. I think over the course of that, that, that three and a half years, we went from like 2,000 sites to over 100,000 sites. So you can imagine the scale at which downtime considerably escalated for us. The volume was, was quite interesting to see. But the reason why I'm here is that we started to see that it's harder for people to fix things when they don't know what the problem is. A lot of the times people start to panic because you're not prepared for it. It is a, a natural fear that people have when you don't know something. And after doing this for a long time, I can safely say that I think we know what works. I think we know what we would like for people to start doing so that it works for them. And I think we would like for people to have a better experience around some of these unplanned outages and reduce the amount that they have to face. So we're just going to go through a quick agenda. Uh, basically, we're going to cover an overview. Then we're going to split it out into two parts. Part one will be log management uh, and basic uh, structuring of your logs. We're going to take a look at the systems involved, which includes Drupal. We're going to be using Composer, the Composer Manager module, and the Monolog module. Once we're there, we're going to take a look at New Relic, see how these new modules can impact us, how they can improve our experience, and things that we can do now to improve our logging. And then we're going to look at incident management. We're going to take a look at PagerDuty. We're going to take a look at Slack. And then we're going to do a, uh, a mock incident so that people can actually see as you can, how you can do it. I think one thing I would like to highlight is this is not for uh, Pantheon. This is not for Acquia. This is not for Rackspace. This is for you if you're a product owner, if you're a business person, if you are a support team, or if you're a developer. These are things that you should be able to do to help your sites in times of need. So what exactly happens when a website goes down? Here's the typical flow. People see their site down, and how do we get it back up? That's usually the first question. And then the next question is, what exactly is going on? And the usual answer when this happens is, I don't know. And then after some haranguing and people start to email each other and things start to spiral down and the temperatures start to rise, it comes down to one of two things. Is it an infrastructure problem or is Drupal sad? And again, I think people need to be more realistic with their expectations of software. Software fails. We all use modules. These modules have deficiencies, which we all need to contribute to improve, actually. And then things start to go even worse. The all caps email starts to, to be sent. People are yelling at you via technology. It's not a good time. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty terrible. And then finally, usually people start to reach out to us and say, hey, can you help us fix it? And I think we've started to, 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 to understand why. is because in Drupal and in PHP, we haven't had a history of establishing good best practices and how we log within our applications and maximizing what we can return from them. Every second that you don't know why your site is down is another second that you are losing part of your reputation and your brand is taking a hit. So the classic. Now that you know your site is down, I'm a business owner, who's the first person you're going to call? Your project was only commissioned to end at launch. And usually that's when people do the most care. You check your checklist twice, you check your DNS three times, you make sure your update.php and Drush is working. But after that, what happens? Who do they call? There is no real good answer. And what happens next is panic, right? So I'm going to just send an email to everyone, uh, the website developer, you know, I'm going to send something to the support guy. He doesn't know. The, the, some people don't even know. So now you're wasting even more time. What you need is a plan, and we really need a plan. 
Like, I don't think you should have any projects that do not have this as part of the process. You should sit down with your customers, your product owners, and your product managers and start doing things like risk assessments. Come up with a simple matrix. What's going to happen more frequently? What's going to happen less frequently? What is the impact? And what is the impact on our business? And then you can start to prioritize. We only need to care about four things, whatever those may be. So we're going to start taking a look into application management and how you can start doing this. There are really five ways you can start to bring this all together and utilize Drupal to do this. First, you need to standardize your logs. You need to get them in a format that can be consumed by other systems like Logly, Spunk, Pager, uh, Paper Trail, and others. You need to centralize them. I think if you've got five servers, logging into one server, going to the MySQL server, going to the PHP server, going to the Redis server, it takes too long. Again, it's more time you're wasting. You need to aggregate your logs. I think it may have happened to all of us when something breaks in the morning, so you find out about it in the afternoon, you try to do a watchdog show, and what do you end up with? 15 minutes worth of logs. The problem that existed before is no longer present. You need to aggregate your logs if you're going to be doing anything meaningful with them. Next, you need to analyze your logs. You need to sit down and start to dig into the data that is there. I think people usually see it as a stream, but you need to look at it from a different dimension, from top down. And finally, you need to alert. So you need to have some way of saying, hey, I've exceeded this threshold. We need to do something, and it's a problem. There are a few problems with the watchdog. One is it's in a semi-arbitrary format. So when Drupal 4.6 came, there were like three parameters. And then in Drupal 4, uh, 5 came, then there were like five and a half parameters. Well, not half, but five. And then finally, it got to a point that it's set and stable. However, if, in case you don't know, the watchdog is no longer going to exist in Drupal 8, and it's going to be replaced. The question is with what, and we'll take a peek later. You can't save the watchdog logs, you can't search them, you can filter, but you can't search, you can't have safe searches, you can't do any reporting, you can't do any postmortems, and it's going to be difficult. Again, you get there and it's 15 minutes, cron is run, it's truncated your logs, it's not going to help you. An important one for debugging and optimization is you don't get any stack traces, so you don't see what caused the slowness or the problem when it occurred. And finally, the watchdog is not very portable. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has actually dug into the watchdog, but this is what the table looks like. It's a hodgepodge of variables and, and replacement things. If you saw a million of these on the screen at one time, what would you do with them? The answer is nothing. So we're going to look at how we're going to standardize. Point number one. In case you don't know, PHP Fig is an organization, the PHP Framework Interop Group. It was started by a group of people who work in the PHP community at a conference called PHP Tech. And what they said is that the PHP in, uh, landscape in general is out of control and we need to standardize. And we need to have a way so that we can communicate within, lo within various frameworks. So we have people from Drupal. So Larry Garfield is our representative. If you don't know, you should talk to Larry Garfield about this. We have people from Laravel. Aurora PHP, and basically every modern PHP framework is adhering to these standards. Drupal 8, again, is using one of these standards in the form of PSR4 for auto loading. We're going to take a peek at Monolog, which is going to be handling the translation and the standardization process, and then we're going to see it in action. So don't worry about that. We'll cover that later. So there are Four, five accepted standards, PSR 0, uh, which has now been replaced as of last year, December, with PSR 4. Uh, if you haven't tried out PSR 4, there's the Drupal console module, which allows you to generate Drupal 8 modules and themes. Please go check that out, because that will give you the boilerplate of what your code should look like. PSR 2, PSR uh, 1 is a coding standard. As people are working between Laravel and Drupal and all these frameworks, they need to have a standard that doesn't just jar everyone every time they look at code. Another thing that we need is a coding style guide. I think within all these different platforms and CMSs, we're solving the same problem over and over, and they want a way to standardize it so it's the same for everyone, and we could start to port these logs and other, inter and other interfaces there. We're going to look specifically at PSR3, and I've already mentioned PSR4. 
So PSR3 gives us a logger interface that allows us to write ways and logs in a way that is extensible and can be shared with multiple pieces of code and framework. It's a really simple class with like eight methods. Each method maps to one of these. These are the standard error reporting levels. Again, so in Drupal it's kind of arbitrary. In Drupal 7 we now follow RFC, RFC 5424. And if you don't know what these logging levels are, you should find out. Again, that's the reality that's coming in the near future. But the reason why you should is it allows you to standardize on a common language, which is one of the most important things during an incident. So for example, you may say it's an error, I may say it's a warning, and we may split hairs until my customer fires us. That's the unfortunate reality. Monolog allows us to send our logs into various places, particularly the watchdog. So what happens is it's similar to an ATM, where you go and you put in your credit card. After that, you get a first question. Put in your PIN code. If that passes, it allows you to bubble up and move to the next stage. The next question the ATM asks you, hey, would you like to take out some money? You then agree or not, and it moves on to the next stage. You carry on until you finally get your money. Or you get to a point within the transaction that you say, no thanks. I won't be paying the $5 fee for your ATM today. And this is basically what it looks like, a series of operations for you to get your money. At each point, it can stop the processing if it needs to, depending on the severity of the errors. Monolog comes with a few components, a logger. A logger basically allows you to have a channel which you can get information from. And there can be multiple. So for example, we're going to be using the watchdog for this case. And then it allows you to have handlers. If you haven't seen Monolog or tried it before, the power is in the handlers. It has a handler for almost literally everything. Syslog, watchdog to, to GALF, so it can go to Greylog. It has a mail handler. It has a, a file handler. It has Slack integration. It has Flowdoc. If you need uh, page duty, if you need new relic, and if you need Logly. So the module itself didn't actually have Logly and new relic, so we wrote it. And it's really simple and really easy to do. The formatter does the processing, so it can go to the various services as we ship the information off. And finally, the processors will help us with that final uh, transaction and get them sent off. So now we're about to get our hands uh, dirty. Uh, we're going to take a look at the log system that we're going to build. First, application performance. Uh, people have already used New Relic, so I'm going to skip over this. We know the features. And this is how it's going to work. Drupal to Composer to Monolog to New Relic. We'll skip the features as people are well versed. Next, we're going to take a look at Logly. Logly is a place where we can centralize. Point number two, centralize our logs. It's also another place that we can aggregate our logs, analyze our logs, and then start to configure alerts. And this is what the trail is going to look from within Drupal. We're going to skip the features, and then we're going to talk a little bit about incident management. There are various frameworks that exist for service management, ITIL, uh, ISO 20000, I think. Some of these are overkill for what we're doing. You just need a basic framework for you guys to get started. So there are a few. In particular, the incident management system is one that we use at Pantheon, but you as developers and organizations can use this as well. Heroku has refined this a little bit, and you can actually go to their blog, and, uh, and they have got some documentation about it. We're going to see a bit of it in action, but I think more what we care about is getting our logs into a way that we can manage and stream them in a sensible way. When an incident happens, it is important that you establish some goals. First, you need to verify that an incident happened. Remember, as we were talking about language, we need to standardize so we can actually say, hey, this broke. We need to do something. Now, the next one should be to restore business continuity. Your brand and your image and your reputation were the things that people valued most, and there's no mistake that that's over there. We need to reduce the impact of the, of the actual events. We need to determine how the attack or problem happened. How do we prevent future incidents or attacks? And how do we improve our security through all this? First, you have to form a team. It doesn't matter whether you're one person or you're 15 people. You need a team. There are certain functions within the incident command system 
namely the incident commander, the one point of control, the one central focal point where decisions are made. It is an, a very well-known fact that once you start to distribute that, it becomes difficult to manage, and it's hard to get people to get to a consensus. Sometimes hard choices have to be made, and sometimes you need to be responsible for making them. I think that's one thing that people need to become more accustomed to, and it's okay. Sometimes it's not the right choice, but a choice is better than no choice. You need to understand the situation. You need the information so you can act on it, and this is where the logs come in. You need to determine the goals. You can do this internally. You can do this with your customers. You also need to prepare, plan, and review. Each of these things you need to iterate on. You need to have regular practice for downtime incidents. You need to have regular reviews of what data you're collecting, and you need to make sure it's useful. So for our incident management configuration system, we're going to be using PagerDuty. Again, we're not going to cover the features, but one of the most important things to remember is this is your incident command center. No emails, no texting people randomly. You talk to the people who need to be notified immediately. It is effective, and we also use it at Pantheon at scale. We have people on each continent in the world, and this is how we keep track of the websites from Shanghai to St. Louis, Missouri. We're going to use Slack HQ for communication, and now, time for live demo. If anyone uh, has a live demo deity that they like to uh, talk to before, please let me know. <laughs> That's a no. All right. Cool. So uh, we're going to take a look at our friend, the watchdog, and understand the classic problem. If, uh, is that a, qu oh, okay. There you go. Is it like a question? Oh, okay. So uh, here is the classic problem. Let's say I wanted to filter down and find out all the errors that I get of a particular type. Easy, right? What if I want to find out the IP address that generated all of those entries? How would you do that with Watchdog? It's a trick question, you can't. So that is part of the problem. Additionally, if we scroll down, we'll notice that we only really have two pages of logs, which is about 100 logs. This site has been online. And this is the, actually the demo site that we use at the booth. These are all modules that are just generally installed from the community, and this is what the, the, the basic logs look like. So we're going to use the Composer Manager module. This is going to manage our dependencies. Uh, if uh, you haven't seen Greg Anderson, who, may, who is a maintainer of Drush, he's doing a, he did a session on Composer and how you can leverage it within your application. We also see another dependency we have is this PSR log. This is the common interface that we talked about earlier, the PSR standard that was established by PHPFig, the PSR standard that is actually in Drupal. So it is no accident. We can actually get the benefits of this while we're using Drupal 7 because it hasn't arrived yet. Next, we'll take a look at Monolog itself. Monolog allows you to define channels, channels that you can get a stream of information from. In this case, we're using Watchdog. What's important is because our development doesn't exist in a vacuum anymore, we need to have a pipeline that we develop in. And in each environment, we need to manage the sensitivity of our logs. We're going to go ahead and take a look at some logging profiles and see what these logging profiles look like. So here we go. Perfect. So in our development, we have a series of handlers, like the ATM transaction where we're going to log to New Relic if the error meets a certain threshold. In that case, we're going to, if it says bubble, we'll bubble and we'll go to Logly. After that, we'll log it to a stream handler. This is an appropriate level for, for development. You really want to see anything that's going to break before it gets to production. Next, if you have a production system, you may choose to limit this down. You have to understand there is a bit of a trade-off when, when you actually end up doing this for performance. If you go and take a look at the, the profile itself, here is a list of handlers. Remember how I was saying you could export to almost literally anything with Monolog? And here we go. So now we're going to use the PHP API to push this off into New Relic from Drupal. We're going to use the REST API from Logly to send our logs to Logly from Watchdog. And if we wanted to, we could add an additional handler. As you see on this page, uh, here is the list which is only a subset because uh, not everything has been ported. So let's go ahead and see what it looks like 
to actually log one of these events. So we saw our watchdog log, and it didn't have much action in there. It wasn't quite as exciting. But one thing we can do is also store some extra meta information or context, things that actually give value to your logs. This is why the one-dimensional view of the watchdog is difficult. We're going to collect the message. We're going to collect the user ID for who did it. We're going to check the request URI, the page that referred it, and all of this additional meta information. Now, let's head over to New Relic. This is the classic view, as I said it before. This is the Mission Bicycle Company website that we're using for the demos. So there are uh, no, no secrets to hide here. Uh, oh, the, the, oh, that's not a very good uh, resolution. Anyway, so we're going to take a look at this. New Relic allows us to get a, a better visibility of our logs. It gives us x-ray vision. It allows us to see code level at what's going on and what's the problem. It also allows us to get a longer tail view. Remember Watchdog had limited us? We could go to a 12-hour view. And bam, it's as simple as that. As you can see, we can start to track our application performance over time. How did this change? Over on the left side, you'll notice the transactions. Whenever we're debugging downtime and you have New Relic available, this is one of the first places I'm going to look. Why? If this is grossly uh, in excess or you know, x times larger than this, don't bother with what's down here. You get the lowest return on investment because it has the lowest impact. Fix what is on top first and then go down. Now you'll start to notice we have this error rate. Traditionally in New Relic, you may not see this, but we start to see these spikes. And that is what's going on within Watchdog itself. Again, we get time filters that don't limit us to just what is in the database. We can start to do things like filtering by URL, sorting the events by count or message, and even finding out where the event was generated, within the watchdog or within the application itself, or sorry, within Drush, is it a background process, or was it a web transaction? So let's start to take a look at the power here. Now that we've got these things logging into watchdog, they happen all the time for your commerce transactions. If it's slow, we start to get an extra layer of visibility. I can see going from top to bottom a stack trace, something we did not get before from Watchdog. And when I'm optimizing and debugging, I can start going up, oh, this looks like core, this looks pretty standard, this looks OK, this looks, uh, this looks pretty normal. Let's see if we can get a history of other events as they may be going on. Oh, we've also got the URL. Nice. So now we have a history, and we can start to see things like, oh, that doesn't look good. Uh, no, that doesn't look good at all. So we can start to say, hey, what's going on over here? As we scroll down, again, we get a nice uh, stack trace. And what we see here is someone wrote this custom module. That was me, uh, by the way. And this is the line that is slow. So now when you, don't have to, when you have to debug things, no more guesswork. No more best guess estimations. You know, no one with some sort of watering stick for the watering hole. This is exactly what's broken, and you fix it faster, and you fix it ASAP. You can start to get a better visualization of what your application is doing by logging more information. New Relic also comes with some handy features. So if you wanted to do some debugging on, uh, oops, that's not a good sign, New Relic but it's still up. So you can see our slowest average response time, and we can start to get a breakdown. If you have a module such as views that is killing you, this is an easy way to find out who the main culprit is and track it down. Again, get the guesswork out of the equation. So when people are down, this is how we find out. I, don't think, I think people think there's some secrets to what we do, and all we're doing is looking at this information. You can go back to your list of transactions and start to get more detailed information. So if you have the pro version of New Relic, it's really useful. So over here, we have our most time-consuming transactions. If we scroll down, you'll actually be able to see a historical trace. So notice how yesterday this problem didn't happen, and then it started happening. What changed? People don't ask this question enough, and I'll tell you what changed. I installed that module that broke. If I wanted to fix it, I would fix that module. And over here, we get insight into some slow transactions and detail. 
So going back to how do you know which part of the application is having issues and which part broke for you, this is a clear way of doing that. Now, with New Relic, it actually tells us with each function, with each step within the, bootstra within the uh, stack trace, what was called, the count that was called at, and the duration. And again, always go for the highest value return. Go for what is at the top, because again, that is probably what is crippling you. If you need to do things like get deeper, New Relic gives you the ability to use stack traces, so you can actually start expanding on this stuff, like, oh, okay, oh, I see here, oh, well. If you start to see like, hey, most of the time is spent here, that's where you should start. Things like SQL statements. I think at Pantheon, this is one of the hardest things that we deal with. People generate views, views does what it wants to do with your query, and then it does what it wants to do with your website. So a lot of time is spent telling people, optimize your queries and optimize your views. There are a number of ways to do this. Uh, there's views query alter hooks. You could write your own. Uh, don't be shy, it's definitely a possibility. So now we have got a strategy in place. We've standardized our logs and they're heading over into, uh, yeah, they're heading over into our centralized location where we can aggregate them. Logly's power is that it can allow you to have dashboards. So for this site, I can get a view of what's happened in the last hour, or I can get a larger visual, and I can start to see what's happened in the last day. You can build your own custom dashboards. So for example, we have some for, say, search. I wanted to see when cron events are happening, when the error rate is beyond what I find acceptable. I also am able to start to get deeper insight into the watchdog table and filter down into these various context rules that are given. Let's go ahead and take a look at the actual search interface. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. I'm going to start going from left to right, and we're going to go through it. Now, let's say you want to start getting more detailed information. What percentage of errors are you getting that are a certain type? With Logly, it basically has taken our watchdog and nicely formatted it into JSON, and each of these JSON fields become filters. So if you've used Solar before, this is pretty much Solar for your logs. I then want to see, for example, what is the breakdown of percentage in a pie chart of what my errors are. I start to get this visualization that I'm getting a lot of PHP errors, and cron is definitely killing me. I think this is something we should add as a widget and put on our custom dashboard so people actually know what's going on. If this pie chart starts to look crazy, you should go ahead and fix it. So let's call it uh, error distribution. Watchdog error distribution. And save. So now, when we head back to our uh, custom dashboard over here, I'm going to refresh so that we can actually pick up our new widget. Perfect. And so now we can uh, click here, click on my custom widget. I've got one for my error distribution. I want to add it to the dash. Excellent. Actually, not so excellent because it's in the wrong position. Let me go ahead and move it down. So now I can start to build a real-time analytics framework out of Drupal. No rules. Don't force Drupal to do things it shouldn't do. Use some of these tools that are available. Going back to the actual search interface, this is nice. But we need to filter down and find out what our problem is. Logly allows us to do this by using these quick filters. And all I need to do is click there. And as you see, now I can dig into multi from multiple dimensions what's going in Watchdog. I'm down to 90 events. Next, let me, oh, that's type, it's the same. So next I want to see, hey, are we getting this error from a particular IP address? And it looks like we're getting it from a range. So it's not a user having a problem, it's a system level issue. Let's switch from that view and we can go back to the collapsed events. I'm going to expand it so everyone can see. What happened to that information when we sent it from Drupal? Well, this is exactly what it looks like. It's formatted JSON. The formatter from Monolog has formatted it in this way so we can leverage it. So I'm going to start just eyeballing it and starting to see, OK, I saw a SQL error, warning file puts. I really care about this SQL error. 
let me find out exactly what's going on. So I'm going to drill down again. And now with this level of granularity, I can see when did this problem begin and how often is it occurring. Oh, snap. Ah, yes. Live demo, everyone. Yeah, we made it. Yeah. All right, cool. So now I'm really starting to get better insight into what's going on. If you ever want to drill down specifically into a range, all you have to do is click and drag, and it will do that for you. Let's say I'm starting to see a particular event spike. I can go ahead and see the events that are surrounding it. Is there anything that's happening 500 times before this happens? If so, I should fix that first. So it's going to go ahead and think about it, and it's going to generate a nice graph with all the data that we need, and boom. Now, finally, I want to see, is this related to a particular IP address? So I expand it. I go here. Ah, my range has shrunk considerably. This is the beginning of the event. This is what the people experienced. This is what needs to be addressed. If this was an outage while your live site had just gone down, this is how you would find out. Standardize, centralize, analyze, aggregate, and finally, and most importantly, alert. You can do even more things. For example, I want to save this search, and I'm going to call it DrupalCon SQL Error Suckage. It's a technical term. Sucks, someone said. Uh, and there we go. You'll notice now that I have a custom dashboard tab. This is persistent. If someone else came to start working on this, they can see the same thing. They can find the problems. They can fix the problems if they're required to. Logly also has a powerful alerting system. So I think when I see this cron error, I really should do something. Chances are I need to run update.php or I need to do a data cleanse. And this is how we can figure out when this has reached a point that I need to do something. If we go ahead and click on the error rate SLA that we created earlier, what you can see here is that uh, we're given various options on what we're going to alert on. So for example, here's the name, the description. Remember those safe searches we were just generating? We can use these to alert on. Now you can start to drill down even further. If the count of errors reaches a certain number before a certain amount of time, we should let someone know. If it's Christmas Eve and you're having a fire sale, I think you'd like to know before January 1st that something is wrong. So we also have the ability to alert and send an email, or in this case, send it to one of our PagerDuty endpoints. And I'm going to have this check every minute just so that we can actually get something for the demo. It will be a bit aggressive for you to do this every minute, but uh, you know it's up to you and what your use cases are. So. I think that basically covers the first part, which is log management. And now we're going to go into a bit of incident management and how you can use PagerDuty as your incident command center. Here's PagerDuty. Let me take a step back. So here's your dashboard. This is where you're managing all your incidents, the incidents that you have that are active, the incidents that you've acknowledged, incidents that are resolved. We also get, again, another quick overview of all of the incidents that have happened. So all of the times that someone broke something on the website while they were doing a demo has alerted here, and this is the history of it. Looking at that website, would you have guessed this was what was going on? No. Uh, it's impossible. The only way you know is now that you're armed with that information. It also allows us to define an escalation chain. Now we can go from one level to another level, you don't need to manage your schedules in a Google spreadsheet. You're better off managing them in PagerDuty because you can do things like override and have other people take over. Next, we can take a look at a uh, different screen, s'il vous plaît. Perfect. You can manage your contact information, which I'll flash quickly, so no one is sending me text messages, hopefully. That was fast enough. We also have some additional features, 
like team management, as I said, so you can group things together, allow different people. As I said, we have people in different regions across the world. We have a U.S. team, we have an EU team, we have people in, uh, in Asia as well. And then we have our friend Kit Wong, who just gets all of our emails. And then, finally, one of the most powerful pieces is reporting. The incident command system, the, the project management lifecycle, Agile, XP, whatever you're using, defines iteration and you should improve with each turn. In other words, you shouldn't just let things go down and close a blind and turn a blind eye. You should start to find out reports. How is my team doing? What is the average time that it takes for them to resolve an issue or to address it? What is the time to first response? And what is the time to resolution? We can see an alerts report. Is there a component within our system that is failing with some regularity? Is it our server? Is it our custom module that's failing? Is it waking people up at four in the morning? And we can get an incidents report, an overview of everything that's going on as we see it, and we can export it. We can filter by day, by week. As you see down here, we have a list of events again. If you're going to be talking to your customers, if they're experiencing issues, you don't want to start filtering through emails and having anecdotal conversations. People should know what's wrong. It'll allow you to be a better developer and produce and give better services. Again, things really went wrong after I added this module. Uh, actually, that's pretty terrible. Uh, wow. All right. <laughs> so again, I, I think it highlights the site itself is crawling. It is in uh, good pain, and it's having issues. Now we're going to head over to Slack. We set up a custom organization so we could show you something similar to what we do and what you could potentially do. So here is the DrupalCon LA room where we hang out. Uh, I think there is some chatter over here. Uh, Suzanne is talking during my session with Kit for some reason, okay. <laughs> I guess. Uh, and most importantly, the incident response room. One of the key principles is to centralize command and communication during an incident. When this happens, it will allow you to, instead of having to phone someone, email someone, text someone, and send them a courier pigeon to actually just have one place to do this. If Suzanne were to join in today or we had Conrad sign up, he'd be able to see the history of the event as it happened. And one of the, more, the longest pieces and hardest pieces is keeping people up to speed with things that are going on. As you can see, we already have some existing events. So what we're going to do next is go ahead and trigger an event and see what the ideal process is. What should ideally happen is that someone should get an email, someone's phone should ring, and then we should get a notification here. Additionally, it should go to the right person, the person who can fix the problem the fastest. So part of when you develop that risk matrix is figuring out who should get what notifications and when. And that way, when you build your escalation chain, you know exactly what broke, and you'll know, hey, Dave, you're taking too long to answer our customer. Our SLA is 20 minutes. Or Dave, do you even know what's going on? So let's go ahead and uh, fire an incident off. Now Dave doesn't know what's going on. Suzanne is now talking again in general chat during my session. Oh, man. <laughs> Live demo, everybody. Live demo. All right, cool. So here we go. I'm going to trigger uh, an error. Uh, on my phone, I developed a nice little Drush app. So what I'm going to do now is via Drush make things go horribly wrong. So I've defined my escalation chain. And so, so oh. Oh, hello. Something is happening. I've been alerted that something broke. If you're a support team, everyone gets to see this. Everyone knows something needs to be fixed. It's your high-value property. It's your high-value customer. You should go ahead and fix it. Uh, at this point, I'm going to call Suzanne and say, can I type? Cool. 
So you've been hearing some beeping, and I guess you've been wondering what that is. That's my phone going off every time there's an, uh, there's an alert. So I'm going to go head over to PagerDuty. Oh, there's my error, and there's my uh, alert. I'm going to click here, and I'm going to reassign this. And I'm going to say, hey, this should probably go to Suzanne. But, oh, no, don't escalate to me because, oh, oh, man. I guess the right person is getting the phone call now. on Drop Alcon website. The failure is error SLA. Press 4 to acknowledge. Press 6 to resolve. Press 8 to escalate to the level 2 on call. Alex Judgewitz. Press 0 for help or press star to repeat this message. Okay. Right. Yes, the event was escalated. So, no need for me to take action here. I'm on the train, I'm on the subway, I'm on a boat, maybe. So I can't do it by going to my computer, but because we're communi you were communicated and we're connected, immediately that happened there. Suzanne's gonna get it, she's got it covered, so now we can go ahead and resolve it. Because we know what the problem is, we can go ahead and say, hey, what's going on over here? We're seeing some unusual activities, and you've set off one of our SLAs. We head over to the log dashboard and see we're starting to see some unusual activity and how Cron is running, and bam. What's going on here? The problem that we said we should fix needs to be fixed ASAP. So now we can reduce the time that it takes to resolve issues. But we made a mistake. I forgot to resolve the issue. Uh, ooh. And I'm going to go ahead and resolve it. Boom. So now, oh, someone's changed it. Uh, let's try. Oh, because I resolved it on my phone. Now it's resolved. Suzanne has worked her magic. The site is back online. We used our playbook, which we had established when we decided what the risks the business had by doing it this way. Suzanne is doing Incident Commander. She's basically taking care of everything, she's updating the status page, and she's communicating. Within the two of us, we've managed to control an incident, address an incident, and now resolve an incident while we're in this demo. So, I think the takeaway here is that you can be in charge of your own destinies. You can do this now, these services are available. Stop building too much into Drupal and having it do all of this for you. Offset it. Let your application focus on what's important. If it's a commerce site, focus on commerce. I think one thing that I'd like to highlight about this is that it just doesn't end at your watchdog. If you're using Drupal Commerce, I'm sure many of you have the commerce reporting dashboard that brings your site to its knees each time you try to generate a report. To avoid this, you can send over non-sensitive information to the logs. And then you can start to do things like find out, hey, if I'm having a campaign, what is the, the turnaround from it? Where are the IPs? Where are the most visitors to my site coming from? Do I need to concentrate my marketing efforts on the EU? Is it better for me to have my campaign during the morning or at night? A lot of this is how it is bound together with the information that you have, and you need to use it. It's sitting right in front of you. On that note, I think we are towards the end. I would say this before I conclude. Please, 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 please start aggregating your logs, standardizing your logs, centralizing your logs, analyzing your logs, and alerting. It is extremely important for us to increase the quality of our Drupal sites, the performance, the expectations, and most importantly, maintaining your brand and your reputation when things matter most. Thank you very much. So, uh, any questions? Uh, I was asked to direct people to the mic, or you can shout out the question and I can answer. Any questions? Question. I'm still being paged. Hey, how's it going? Sure.
Yes. And the language of our sit blog isn't exactly the most robust. Yes. So what I did was I sort of loosely put it together. It got it to work. But I would rather not do it that way if I could. Yes. That's question number one is how do you deal with blogs that don't work with sit blog? And how do you centralize them? And number two, we have paid trail blogging. Is it better to do that or does it make sense to actually work on a blog staff and so on? Ah. You, sir, deal with logs for, uh, yes, so you're more seasoned than most. So the question was, uh, how do I standardize my log? So uh, you actually touched upon something that's interesting. So first point, separate your application logs from your server logs. Why that's important is because agent list collection, I can use the HDPI to at least get my application logs. Then you have your server logs. Uh, there are various tools such as Logstash, which he mentioned, which allow you to do the transformations and normalize your, your, your logs into a standardized format. Uh, maybe we'll talk a bit later about your actual log problems and how they relate, per, you know, but it's definitely an issue. Part of the reason why you need to standardize is so that you're not doing this dance on the fly when you encounter a new log format. That's why standardized log formats are so important. And then your second question was for real time. Um, it really depends. Uh, I think what you would like is definitely our syslog to be doing it. Uh, and, you know, having agents, we have a script that you can actually run that will just trigger our syslog and be like, go grab this via SFTP or our syslog. Logstash. Yes. Right, so I think your best bet is definitely setting up a Logstash server as an intermediate. Uh, it'll then be the broker between the communication and do your transformation of logs, and then you can ship them off. Uh, there's no, um, yes, or you can have RSS log on the servers themselves, but it takes, some, it takes some work, especially if you have a distributed system, to, to kind of wrangle them and tell them, hey, this is the canonical place for you to, to drop your logs. Hey. hey. Uh, so I think you mentioned earlier that you were using... Logly's REST API to push. Yes. Uh, have you found any like performance problems with that, or like run into situations where that would actually exacerbate a problem? Yes. So Eric brings up a good point. One of the things that we looked at earlier was uh, development and logging profiles, and sensitivity to performance is one that you should take pretty seriously. So I don't think you should be running this in production as Logly itself. You should probably be using the RSYS log agent if you have, or if you have access to it. Um, so you should avoid that where possible. What we generally recommend is if you're doing this during your development, you're doing this during your integration and testing, then you shouldn't have any problems when you get to production, and you can turn it off and just use the syslog handler, and that's, that's why I had it like that. But yes, you should consider that. Thanks. All right. Just like to thank the live demo gods for allowing us to get out of here alive. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.